Hey everyone, it's Zach. I hope you're all staying home and staying safe out there. Even though we don't have games to watch, we still have plenty of great podcasts to listen to. And one of my favorites, the great Mina Kimes show featuring Lenny, of course, Lenny, really the star of the show. This week, Mina discusses the top quarterbacks in next week's NFL draft with Spencer Hall. You can find the Mina Kimes show with Lenny wherever you get your podcast. And now, The Low Post. Welcome to... The Low Post Podcast, live from an undisclosed quarantine location, where I am thrilled to be joined for the very first time by one of the great broadcasters in sports history, that is not hyperbole, and Hall of Famer 2020 Kurt Gowdy Award recipient, Mr. Mike Breen. How are you? Zach, it's great to hear your voice, and I can. this is a big day for me because I can finally stop answering the question from friends and family. Why have you never been on Zach Lowe's podcast? So that now it ends. Now I can tell people, yes, I've been on. Well, one of the reasons, as you're going to see, is I'm a little hesitant to inflict emotional cruelty on you (laughs) by making you revisit painful Knicks losses from the 90s, which is going to happen. So just be prepared for that. Um, How are you? Are you like um, are you like hankering to call games? Are you like calling board games at home with your kids? Like Joe Buck is calling random stuff on Twitter. Are you do you have the instinct to call things? I I am hankering to call games. No question. I don't have the instinct to do that stuff. I think sometimes it's nice uh, for for fans to to get a rest from from my voice because you get sick of a certain voice after a while. So I like to take the downtime, but I am so desperate to get back, uh, especially now this time of year. As you know, this this is the greatest time of year for me. And the finals are great, but I love the first couple of rounds and the way the playoffs start. So I'm uh, I'm dying to get back and and call some games. The first round of the playoffs is what I imagine like just a cocaine bender is like for a basketball <laughs> fit, just constant games breaking down X's and O's like just no one is sleeping. I do. I, I just imagine that's what it's like. If you want to call, if you want to call um, my daughter and I are in a very intense quarantine shoots and ladders competition. If you want to call a shoots and ladders game, you're welcome to do that. Well, I want, I want to 10 things I like and don't like about shoots and ladders because I'm sure there are parts of the game that you love. And I played it when I, when my kids were younger. Um, but there are also things about the game that can be a little annoying. So I, I want to 10 things I like and don't like about shoots and ladders. Honestly, I'm, I'm running out of things. So we may have to, <laughs> we may have to default to, uh, to shoots and ladders. By the way, you are the MC very often for, um, the Hall of Fame. You are, you are getting your Hall of Fame award this year knock on wood that we actually are able to go to Springfield and do all those things. I, you know, in September, uh, in obviously Kobe is going in posthumously KG Duncan. I mean, this is an all time class, Rudy T who we're going to talk about. Um, do you get to MC yourself? Are you still going to MC? Like, how is this going to work? <laughs> no, I actually, I haven't, I haven't MC'd it in a while. I did a couple of years ago on the, uh, the Gowdy award night, because Doris Burke was going in, and I, I really wanted to, to MC it when, when Doris got the Gowdy Award, but I haven't been I haven't done it in a while because they changed who covers it. So um, it's something that I, I miss doing. And quite honestly, Zach, it was for me it was one of the honors of of anything I've ever done. It was one of my favorite nights because you see uh, on a night like this, you know these great great players, all who obviously have egos to get to where they are. They had to have egos. The, the way that night humbles them all, it was the thing that I enjoyed the most. And to see how it really meant something. These guys are confident. They've got egos. They've got, you know, they're indestructible. But on those nights, to see the emotion come pouring out of a lot of them, it was, it was something that I, I, I always cherish doing. Um, well, we missed your voice. I hope we do have games soon um, one way or another. But, um, you know, obviously we're all just trying to stay healthy. And, and we are now five days away from the – uh, event that everyone is waiting for because it's the only thing going on in sports and that's the release of the last dance uh, and the Michael Jordan 1998 documentary. So I just want to talk about Michael Jordan, if that's okay with you. Absolutely. Let's do some Jordan. So you begin with the Knicks on, on the radio, I believe in 92, 93, Correct. which is, um, I, I don't know if it's the peak of the Riley era because they don't make, they make the finals in 94, obviously. Um, but I think it's, it's maybe it's arguably the best team and the team that was seated number one in the playoffs and at home court over Michael Jordan and the Bulls. And it was like one of the only times you could talk yourself into maybe one of these teams has a chance. 
and the Knicks go up 2-0 in that series, the Bulls hold serve at home, and then you come back to MSG for one of the landmark NBA games of the last 25, 30 years, whatever it is, um, which is the Charles Smith getting blocked at the rim four times in a row with the Knicks down two uh, toward the end of the game. Pick anything for pick that game, pick that series. What are your sort of flashbulb memories? Mike Breen, year one with the Knicks, and this is what you get. What are your flashbulb Jordan Bulls memories from that series? Well, go, going into the series, because the team was that good, um, they, they were special. They had everything. Uh, they had the great coaching. They had the toughness. They had the star player. Uh, they had the perfect role players who could deal with the physical nature of the game. I mean, as you know, uh, it was such a different game back then. It was played differently. It was coached differently. It was officiated differently. Um, and these two teams really felt – you felt they were the two best teams in the league. And if the Bulls were number one, the Knicks were number two. But this was the year going into that playoffs – um, the Knicks really believed that they could beat them. And then the John Stark stunk in game two just elevated everybody's, this is it. We're, we're going we're to talk about that done. All right. So, so that's to, to so many Knicks fans, that was a sign. This is, this is the year that we're going to knock off the Bulls and, and the, the mighty Michael Jordan. Uh, so even going into game five and the Knicks outplayed the Bulls in game five. Um, they had played so well all game long. And uh, you and I have discussed this in the past. Uh, the killer stat line to this day, and it, it, it breaks your heart if you're a Nick fan, were the free throws. Missing 15 free throws. It 20, just, 20 of 35 from the line, which right, I, it, I was re-watching parts of that game last night to prepare for this, and I remembered vaguely that the Knicks left points on the table. That's a lot of points. <laughs> In a game you lose by three, that's a lot of points. Because they, they have it, it, it kept the Bulls with a chance to win it, and it wasn't just one guy. I think everybody missed free throw. Might have been one player uh, was perfect from the line, like maybe two for two or three. Doc, for three. Doc Rivers. Doc Rivers was oh. three for three. Okay, so everybody else uh, missed their share. And Patrick Ewing, who who made some brilliant plays throughout the game, he missed about six free throws. John Starks missed missed three or four free throws, um, and that's the painful part because you really felt they were better now. Um, you know, I've done a lot of big games at the Garden, especially back in the 90s. And for, for the Knicks, that was as deflating a loss, perhaps more so than even an elimination game. When they lost game seven to the Pacers a couple of years later, um, that was a, a horrific ending. But this one was so deflating because the game was there. They should have won the game. And now they're down 3-2. They've lost the home court advantage. And you know, and right? You know. I'm the most optimistic <laughs> Uh, Nick fan going and an optimistic broadcaster. But once that, that buzzer sounded and Charles Smith was, you know, had a shot blocked, uh, you just, you just knew it wasn't going to happen in game six. Everybody said the right thing. Everybody said, okay, Hey, we can still beat him. And all we got to do is beat him one time, bring it back to the garden. But there was such an air of deflation. Like I've never experienced at Madison square garden as that night. Yeah, there are, there are losses like that, and particularly when you're on the road for the next game where you take the loss and you just know we're just not going to be able to recover from this. And now you're going to Chicago. You're playing the greatest player of all time. You're definitely not going to recover. It's why I give the Spurs so much credit in 2013 after the Ray Allen shot, which is another game you called, um, for coming back in Game 7 in Miami and really taking that game to the wire because that was another – those games just have the feel of you're punched in the gut and you can't – you're just not going to be able to recover. Right. I, I'm so glad you said that about Game 7. I think it's one of the most underrated um, heart and soul performances by a team to, to be so crushed by the way it happened in Game 6. But going back to, to, to the Knicks and the Bulls – 93, it, yeah. You, yeah, you say, you say road game. There are road games, and then there were games at Chicago Stadium. Uh, that is still the loudest building I've ever been in my life. Um, you would be sitting next to your partner. I was doing the games with, with Clyde Frazier. And during, like, one of the big roars, I'd be screaming, you know, something, trying to get his – you couldn't hear the person sitting next to you. It was without question the loudest. It was an amazing building – as you know, just one of the great atmospheres in in all of sports, and now you put that along with Michael Jordan, and it just was, you know, he, there was just this feeling of doom going in there, and there was nothing worse if you were the visiting team to hear that roar uh, again to be so deflated. 
um, when when they went on their one of their runs. Now, I think I misspoke already earlier. I think the Knicks were only down one when Charles Smith got stuffed four times in a row. Um, and, and then they, and then they, Chicago goes and makes a layup at the buzzer. BJ Armstrong, I think made a layup at the buzzer to make it three. Um, Ewing had blocked a shot and forced a shot clock violation leading up to that, to, to give the Knicks a chance to win the game on that possession. And then of course, Charles Smith, I think it went Grant, Jordan, Pippen, Pippen on the shot blocks slash strips of Charles Smith, who was never the same after that, but like, take me. Take me on the floor or in the locker room after that game. Like, what are the images that stick with you from from just the the come down of that game? Well, there there was anger because there was the feeling that he was fouled, and you know we've all watched the different angles from it. And was there contact? Absolutely, there was contact. Was there enough contact um, to blow the whistle? Well, obviously, one side feels yes. And the other side feels no way. Um, but back in that NBA, in that uh, era, um, I, I think most of those times the whistle didn't blow. Um, so anger was at first. And then, you know, then there was the, the thought, I'm sure every Nick player, as they're going back to the locker room thinking, oh, we've got to go back to, to Chicago Stadium. It was, there really was a dread to going back there. I mean, it was exhilarating. But to have to beat them again and now have to beat them two times in a row, it was such a daunting task. And uh, I, I do remember, um, you know, most of the players, you know, you have good relationships. You talk, nobody wanted to talk. Nobody wanted to talk. It, it, it was such a, it was such a deflating feeling. It was such, such a deflating moment. But obviously, you know, Pat Riley, the first thing, because he's the great motivator, the first thing he talks about is, okay, all we need to do is go back when one game, we'll bring it back here to the garden. So they had the right mentality. They were, Emotionally, they were a very strong team, not only, you know, physically and not only a talented team, but they were emotionally a very strong team. So I think some of them felt, OK, we could perhaps do this. But uh, I think for a lot of the fans, they were like, there's no way that we're going to beat them two times in a row, especially uh, going in game six. It's maybe I was I was a dumb, I was 15 during this series. So like Jordan, for I'm 42 now for Jordan, for anyone my age. That's when we came of age as sports fans. Jordan is always going to be Jordan. There's just never going to be another athlete like that for our generation. Um, and I, there's just never been an athlete. And again, maybe I was a dumb 15-year-old kid, but I just didn't think it was possible for Michael Jordan to lose. I, I, there has never been an athlete, I think, I mean, maybe the only equivalent is like boxing with Mike Tyson when you just thought it was impossible for him to ever lose. And so when the Knicks were up 2-0, all my friends were Nick fans. I grew up in Nick fan country in Connecticut. I was not a Nick fan. I hated the Pat Riley Knicks. I bet all of them, like 10 bucks each. I didn't even get odds. I was like, I'll take the Bulls. You guys are up 2 0. I'll take the Bulls to win the series. I have, at, like, I had no doubt that the Bulls were going to win the series. None. Zero. I didn't care that they were down 2 0, that they didn't have home court. It was just impossible to imagine them losing. And it's hard for people to explain now about just like what it I, I just I can't it he just was invincible like it was impossible to imagine Michael Jordan's team losing a playoff series well it, he had this he had this mystique about him and, and I remember one of the things I, I couldn't wait for was to see him play in person for the first time and back when I was doing radio all the radio broadcast locations were courtside so he was right there in front of you and there's only been a handful of players where you know, you hear the phrase, oh, I'm in awe of somebody. Um, you were in awe when you saw him in person, as great as he was on television. When you saw the way he carried himself, when you saw the way he stared at an opponent, um, it was it was intimidating. And, and there's only been a handful of players that have this mystique. For me, in, in almost 30 years of doing this, um, I think Kobe Bryant had had a lot of that same LeBron James when you first see him. Now, this I'm talking about when you first see these people in person. Um, Allen Iverson even had a little bit of that as well. When you saw as small as he was, there was just there was this special dynamic about this this person. Their, their, their body language had this charisma, but nobody had it like Jordan. And the thing was, what I used to get a kick out of what I love so much is when I was broadcasting the games, you know, you have your headphones on. But I would always, when he was around, I would take off one of the headphones because so, you still want to hear your partner, just so I could, if I could catch a glimpse of his conversation. And he was so 
I mean, he could be so intimidated and mean, obviously to his <laughs> opponent, but to his teammates too. He would give his teammates the stare or give his teammates instructions. And it was intimidating as a teammate. And then, of course, there's also uh, the referees. He could be so intimidating to the referees. I remember one particular time, it happened right in front of me. Uh, he goes up and he was upset with a no call. Uh, and he is in the official space and he is dropping one F-bomb after another after another. And you could see the, the official was like, it's just, it was intimidating. So he walks away. And then the very next play, Chris Childs commits a foul. And Childs goes over to the official and goes, that was BS, using the, the, the term. Yeah. Technical foul. Technical foul. I just Immediate. watched 30 seconds ago, <laughs> Jordan dropped maybe 14 F-bombs in two sentences, and the official is intimidated. Chris Childs says that's BS, technical foul. So he just – he had this presence about him. Uh, you know, again, it's – I sound like a little kid – but it was I was in awe when I first saw him. And and as a Nick fan growing up, and then as a Nick broadcaster, especially the first couple of years, it's like you have this special feeling of of you can't believe what you're doing. And and fortunately I still have that in a lot of ways. But I had this love hate relationship with him because this is this unbelievable player, the respect factor, the admiration you have. But he broke my heart and he broke Nick fans' hearts time and time again. So you, you hated him. You, you couldn't fully, fully embrace this, this spectacular player, one of the greats of all time, because of how he time and time again deflated you with his play. And you could see the way he delighted in it whenever he threw that final dagger, whenever he, he had that big game, um, the, the way he walked. It just it made it, it, made it harder to, uh, to take. Well, I just – I mean, by the end of their second run – uh, I was just I was rooting for whoever they I was rooting for Utah in the 97 and 98 <laughs> finals because I just I started to feel badly for all of these players minus the Elijah on Rockets who were never going to win because Michael Jordan just was unbeatable. It's like the 95 loss to the Magic when he came back from baseball. That doesn't even count. That's like just like put that aside. It's like in my mind, it doesn't count because he had just come back and. Remember there was I don't remember it was 97 or 98 Utah ties the series 2-2 the the flashbulb moment is that Stockton to Malone like full court one-handed pass late right, in the right. game and and for a second watching that game with my father actually on the couch for a second I kind of believed the Jazz were going to win that series and five seconds later, even as the Jazz are winning that game, I'm like, yeah, they're not going to win the series. There's no chance. Like there's that and if sure enough they don't win the series. Um yeah, so I won a lot of money off my friends in 1993. Uh, Congratulations. Uh, yeah. Thanks for the torturous memories. But you know, the, the, the other thing that I, they, I think kind of – I hope the, the piece, and I, obviously I haven't seen it yet, and I can't wait for it to come out. Um, Scotty Pippen was, to me, the best help defender I've ever seen play, the very best. But the most dominant perimeter defensive player I've ever seen when he was at his best was Michael Jordan. People wow. forget – what a spectacular defensive player he was. Now, did he play that way all the time? No. But when he wanted to, people forget he just was – he was smothering. Uh, he was suffocating. Uh, he would take – he could take somebody out of the game like that. He was a special, special defensive player. And that kind of gets forgotten because of all the, the unbelievable offensive exploits. It's funny. I was watching the um... – Yesterday I was watching Game Seven between the Pacers and the Bulls in 1998, the last Jordan, the the last dance season, and because I wanted to remember, you know, this was really maybe the only time in Michael's run in the six title runs that they were really truly on the ropes. Now the Knicks took them to Game Seven in '91, I think, um, or '92, one of those 92. years, '92. But Game Seven was a blowout. The Bulls won by a thousand points. This was like down to the wire, and the parallels with game five in 1993 that we're talking about the Charles Smith game are Indiana had a horrific free throw shooting game in game seven. Now part of that was Dale Davis who could not shoot free throws at all, but you do, it does remind you like even the bulls needed a little bit of luck in these, in these two games where their season and their championship runs hung in the balance. But to your point, Pippen was guarding Mark Jackson in that series and Pippen could be, pressing Mark Jackson, like right in his face as Mark Jackson is trying to throw an entry pass to Rick Smith. And Mark Jackson, with Pippen in his face, 
throws the entry pass to Rick Smith, and Pippen, like some sort of phantom, is then suddenly back on Rick Smith, <laughs> stealing or deflecting the entry pass. And you're like, this dude, like, how could this guy do this? Like, for my money, Pippen, the best perimeter defender of all time, comes down to Pippen and Kawhi. And Gary Payton's in there, and Jordan maybe gets in there, but Gary Payton's a little undersized compared to those guys. But Pippen on defense was just doing stuff that even you watch it now, and it's like this guy is literally everywhere. He, he could guard all five players on one possession. And I, you saw that just because his ability to rotate. Sometimes he played a free safety depending on the, on the opponent they were playing. Um, and not only did he have the physical capabilities, the long arms, the size, the athleticism, uh, his defensive instincts were incredible, just incredible. And, you know, obviously Jordan uh, deserves everything he can. But as you say, there were a lot of times that there were some series, not a lot, but a handful where they could have eliminated and didn't win one of those titles. And if Pippen's not there, if Pippen's defense is not so ever present, uh, they probably don't win some of those. And, and you were talking about watching Jordan up close and, and watching some old Jordan stuff yesterday reminded me, man, there was nothing cooler. And I just mean cool. I don't mean what I just literally mean in the most visceral sense, cool. There was nothing cooler than Michael Jordan catching the ball in the pinch post with his back to the basket and before taking a dribble, arching his back into his right. defender right. and just kind of side. Like, how many of us growing up tried to imitate that in pickup games? Like, it was just – it was the coolest thing. It was even – like, the way he runs and jogs back and appears to be levitating, that's cool. We can all try and imitate that, whatever. No one's going to ever get that. But all of my friends, we all tried to do – we thought that was just how you played in the post. It was the coolest – because it's, it's not just that it looks cool the way he's arching his back. It's that you know the greatest predator in the history of the sport is taking these brief moments to think about how am I going to destroy this guy on this possession. And the, the thing, too, with, with all what he did, he was always – I mean, every defense, with some exceptions when they would occasionally um, go by, all right, we'll stop everybody else. But for him to do what he did when every defense was geared to stop him, when everybody knew – what he was going to do in most cases, uh, that's what makes his accomplishment so much more incredible. You know, you talk about that the arching back. You know, you watch the similarities and some of the stuff that Kobe did. It, it really is, it's extraordinary um, how much he patterns even little nuances of his moves and the way he walked and carried himself on the court like, like Michael did. Uh, the, by the way, the fourth quarter of that game, game five in 1993, the score was 17-17. I mean, just like think about how grinding those games were. Um, you were also there um, for a top five Jordan game of all time is probably the double nickel game, which was I think his fifth game back from returning from baseball. His eighth game, I think it was his fifth game in March of 1995. He puts up 55 against the Knicks at Madison Square Garden, and that game for one of the only times – actually, I don't know how often this happens, but if you look at – if you watch old clips, the marquee over MSG, it's not about the Knicks. It's about Michael coming back to Broadway. It's about right. the Bulls coming back to Broadway. And the celebrities in the in the in at MSG that game is just an absolute murderer's row. Like, everybody was at that game. So what are your flashbulb – obviously, everyone remembers the 55, the pass to Weddington for the dunk at the end of the game. I don't know what you re- – what do you remember about the atmosphere, about about watching him play that night? Uh, well, I remember prior to the game, um, everybody was there so early. The place was packed early, and that's not normally the case uh, during the week. Uh, and as you said, it was loaded with celebrities. But when he first came out, um, it, it just it's hard to describe the sound of the building when he first came out because there was this like <gasps> there was this gasp. OK, there he is, because, you know, he played in the four or five games and he hadn't played particularly well. He, he, on some games, he had a decent amount of points, but he wasn't shooting the ball well. He was a little sloppy, a little um, inefficient, which you would expect. So you didn't really know what to expect, but he always rose uh to, uh, to the occasion when he came to the garden. But it was the, the pregame feeling in the building. And when he first came out, it's like there was – Nick fans, they wanted a clap, and certainly some of them did because they were so excited to see this great player. We get the opportunity. We get the privilege of watching this great player play again. Even Nick fans had to feel that way. And I, I know I did. 
yes, we have a better chance of beating them without them. But, <laughs> but the fact that uh, you can see this greatness again in person. So there was like, I think half the people were feeling, all right, we want to clap. We want to give him a standing ovation because we're glad we're back. But they're saying, well, I, we can't clap for this guy. This guy has crushed us and broken our hearts so many times. How can we do that? So they were like torn. But you can almost see, and maybe it's it's me um, thinking differently because I, I know what happened. But I remember watching them in the warm-ups, and there was this this focus, this this way he was perspiring so much in the warm-ups that you knew he wanted this to be the special night, to be the breakout night. And right from the opening tip, he just he had it. He didn't have that that same flow and rhythm in the previous games in the comeback. He had it right from the opening tip that night. He scored 20-something in the first quarter, I think. So you know right away, okay, I, I'm watching something that might be special, um, which which has to be a, an amazing feeling that you get, you know, maybe five times a season or something like that. And this is even on a different level because it's Michael Jordan. It's the baseball sojourn that's over now. Do you remember feeling that? And when you feel that, do you put extra pressure on yourself as a broadcaster? Like I'm, I'm going to have to mark something historic here and I want to get it right. Well, the first thing you think of, at least for me is um, you, you constantly tell yourself, all right, calm down. Let's don't, don't lose it. Don't get crazy. Cause you know, you, your adrenaline is flowing. You get hyped up. So the first thing you tell yourself, all right, let's not go crazy. Let's not go screaming when he hits his second basket. Oh, it's six to nothing. You know, you can't go early you got it it's the crescendo from a broadcaster so i remember on games like that where you just say all right let's call the game settle down settle down and save everything for the big crescendo for the big finish at the end and then you know i I don't i'm not one that likes to try and think ahead of time of what to say i I like to think of okay how am i going to frame this Uh, i've got i got great advice early in my career that said uh don't wait till the buzzer sounds uh, to kind to to try and and um, put into words what that game meant, uh, the big picture of that game. Start leading into that. Start talking about it with like five or four minutes to go. So usually with about five or four minutes to go, I think okay, uh, do a little preview. Uh, this could be one of the great performances that you know things like that where you lead into it before you get to that final authoritative wrap up of it. And and it's advice that has stayed with me. Uh, that I think is good because you want to give people a, of what to look for. Or are they really seeing something special? Uh, so that's the way I approach that. Uh, but I do remember a night, a night like that where you, you have to tell yourself, okay, easy does it. Let's not get carried away. Uh, just keep calling the game with the energy and enthusiasm the appropriate way. And then if the big moment happens, that's when you, you, you raise it up. I, rem- I I was reading a couple of stories about you. I don't remember who told you this or, or where you got the line, but I, I think you were quoted and one of them is saying, someone told you or you tell yourself, don't say great when you mean good. Like don't, don't use up your greats. Like you got to save your adjective great for when it's really, really great. And like, that's, that's sort of what you're telling yourself. Like it's calm down, calm down. Like maybe he shoots five of 30 for the rest of the game. And it's not a remarkable game, but I've, uh, that's a very, cause you, I think are a less is more broadcaster in a lot of ways. You don't overdo it. You don't over talk. You don't over insert your personality. I, I think to the point that people would maybe like, like 5% more of Mike Breen's personality. Although the guys you're calling games with are bringing personality for, for days. Um, <laughs> but I, that I, I, I like that line. Don't say great when you mean good. Well, you, you have to save it for when it truly is great. And I, I learned that from Marv Albert because Marv, in the way he described the play and the way his voice was, uh, if you weren't watching, say you were doing something while the game's on and you heard his voice go up, you turn because you know, okay, this is a special play. When he, when he said that this one, you know, a spectacular play by Michael Jordan. Now, he may have used spectacular more than I can remember, but he didn't use it a lot. And that's what made that call so special because that was spectacular. If he's calling, you know, plays three times a game spectacular, then it doesn't mean as much. But that call was one of the great calls in the history of of NBA play-by-play because um, he didn't use superlatives unless a play deserved that superlative. I also think um, Smith stuffed, Smith stuffed, Smith stuffed, Smith stuffed. I I wonder if halfway through that, he in his head, it clicked like, this is all I should say because the repetition of it and the alliteration of it 
it's a really great call. And he kind of rises up as it goes on. But it just just to say the same thing over and over again, hammered into you in the moment, how ridiculous it was that the same thing just happened four times. It's a really, it's a simple but great call, I think. Well, it, there's so many. So, he's the greatest basketball play-by-play voice of all time, has always been and will always be. He's the standard we all look to get to. And for me growing up as a Nick fan and listening to him night after night, you just, you get lessons like that. And he knew in a big moment, um, he called the big moment as well as anybody who's ever done this in any sport. When it comes to insurance, State Farm has all the makings of a top-tier player. First, they make it look easy, manage your coverage, pay your bill, even file a claim from the palm of your hand with the State Farm mobile app, which was just awarded Best Insurance Mobile App of 2019, coveted. And like a great teammate, they know your tendencies. State Farm agents are local, so they'll help you choose coverage that fits your needs. State Farm is always there to coach you through it with the answers you need when you need them. When you want the real deal, go with State Farm. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Let's do a couple on the Michael Jordan interregnum where there is no Michael for 94 and most of 95 because those are peak Nick years. That's the year that they make the finals. And then 95, their series against the Pacers in the second round is like just an all-time insane seven-game series. So question one, what do you remember about the OJ game, which is game five of the 1994 NBA Finals? <laughs> so um, I'm doing the game uh, on radio, and at that point the radio booth was just above – the player's entrance when they come in and out on the tunnel. It was the best location ever for a radio broadcast because it was just up enough where you can see the entire court. But at the same time, you were still close where you could really get a sense of the action. Now, you couldn't hear the commentary, but it was the perfect place to, to make a radio call. And we had a monitor in that booth where we, we could you know look for replays if we had to discuss replays. The other thing is you're surrounded by fans and they're all season ticket holders and they're all friends by that time in the season. Like, you know, them all by name, you has your kids, the whole thing. So it's like a little family were up there. So it happens and, and the, uh, the game goes on and now the split screen is there and it was so distracting. (laughs) And I, and I remember saying to myself, uh, this is the biggest game I've ever called, and I'm distracted because I'm looking, because the word had gotten out exactly what it was. So the TV is really causing me problems, because every time I'm going down, I'm, I'm looking. I'm just taking a check to see if, the, if the, the Bronco is still going. So I turn to our statistician, Harry Robinson, uh, who's been doing Nick Radio statisticians for, for about 40 years, one of the, one of the great uh, the people in the business. And I said to Harry, I said, Harry, you got to turn off the TV. I'm distracted by it. So Harry goes to turn off the monitor and all of the fans around us are screaming, no, 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 don't turn it off. Don't turn it off. <laughs> they were watching it and they wanted to watch both. And out of my respect for them, I'm like, okay, all right, Harry, leave, leave it on. But everybody was watching uh, our monitor in that section because they wanted to see what was happening. It was so distracting. And, and then, you know, you just had to kind of get with it and it turned out to be such a, uh, you know, such an enormous game at the time. Um, but it was really, it was surreal. You couldn't believe it. Uh, and especially because of who was in it. Um, I have no memory of the game. I have, I don't, I don't even remember that it was in New York. Like I, I don't remember anything that happened in the game. I know the Knicks won because they went up three games to two and, and going into Houston for six and seven. I don't have any, I'd like, I'll look at the box score. I have zero memory of the entire game. None. Yeah. I, I'm the same. And I think most people feel the same way because it just, it, it overwhelmed everything. That's, and as much as, all right, now it's three, two in the finals. Um, people were still saying after the game, all they wanted to talk about was what's going on. What's the thing with OJ? Even the players, it was like they couldn't believe it. Uh, I do remember game six and game seven, though. So I, 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 I wonder what your vantage point was in Houston. And if you can close your eyes and see the John Stark shot at the end of the game that Olajuwon makes a sensational recovery to get a fingertip on that shot. And that, I mean – I was having a conversation on a podcast like two months ago about what are the most iconic misses in NBA history because we don't remember (laughs) misses like we like we remember makes. I don't even consider that a miss actually. I consider that an iconic block by Akeem Olajuwon. But can you close your eyes and see it? Well, the the interesting thing is it 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 almost was a disastrous call for me. 
came very close to being a disastrous call because we were down, we're uh, courtside right next to the Nick bench. And the Nick bench was on the opposite side of where that, that shot was taken. It was down the other end of the court. So now here comes the play and I'm looking. And because I'm, I'm situated where I am, it's hard to see that left corner. It's hard to see if he's behind the arc. So he takes the shot. Now, if this shot goes in, the Knicks are NBA champions. Okay. It's a good, it's a good, have, people forget it's literally a championship winning shot. Yes. So the Knicks are champions and I have make this, this, this dream call of the Knicks are NBA championships. They went, you know, whatever I was going to uh, thinking of saying. Anyway, I can't see if he's behind the arc. So I don't know if it's a two pointer or a three pointer. Now that's happened before. And what you do as a broadcaster is now the next thing you look for, and this all has to happen in a couple of seconds. You have to look for the referee to see if the referee has his hand up that it's a three-point attempt. Now, in this case, all three referees were blocked. I couldn't see them. They were behind a player or in a crowd. So I can't see if the official has his hand up for a three-point attempt. I can't tell if Starks is behind the arc as the shot goes up. So if that shot goes in, I have no idea immediately if it's a three-pointer to win an NBA title or if it's a two-pointer to tie the game. And I would have had to pause or who knows, I would have made a disastrous call that probably would have stayed with me for the rest of my career. So in a, in a sick, uh, distorted way, him missing the shot saved me from blowing what could have been the first big chance I had for, for a big call. And it always, I always wonder what would have happened. Obviously, I wanted him to hit it. I would have loved for the Knicks to win a championship. But I was, I was like sweating that I might blow this call. And it's all happening in a couple of seconds. Uh, uh, on the, by contrast, um, the Ray Allen shot in 2013, that, that was chaos because the Spurs have no timeouts, which you note immediately, Spurs have no timeouts. But then the game stops and there was just mass confusion. But I just rewatched it this morning. You're on it, like you you were dialed in. Like the rev- the Spurs have no timeouts. You had the viewers alerted to that right away. You knew why they were stopping the game when people were confused about why they were stopping the game. Like you were you. I don't know if your ankle was better or what, but but you were dialed in on exactly what was happening. Well, I couldn't thank you. I, I couldn't see his feet, but uh, I saw the referee in that because we were down a little bit on the left side and it was hard to see his if his feet were actually behind it but I saw the ref signal the three pointer when the shot was up. So that you're able to see. And then the other thing too, you just know, he knows exactly. He, he, he does that, you know, several hundred times before every game. So, you know, he's not going to be stepping on a line. The guy's just incredible that the, uh, the, the routine that he did and, and the repetitions of the same thing. Um, but yeah, no, it just, it, it all fell into place. It was one of those special games. Um, and, and, you know, Jeff, Jeff as well. I mean, Jeff was, I just talked to him the other day about this. His performance in that game, I thought was one of the great performances by an analyst ever in a big time game. He was phenomenal. You know, his usual fun stuff, but his strategy is, is um, trying to think about what teams are going to do. Uh, I, I thought he was phenomenal in that game. And that's, that's one of those where, where you, you walk away from after that night and you, you feel good because, you know, our, our crew, we have just the greatest crew, um, uh, Tim Corrigan, the producer, and Jimmy Moore, the, the uh, director. And we just were all on the same page that day. But that was that was a special uh, – that was one of those special ones. Yeah, Coach Van Gundy was on the why is Tim Duncan not in the game thing early before before the, the rebound happened. He was on like this is – this is could come back to haunt them. Yeah, no, he, he – uh, that was one of – that was a Michael Jordan-like performance by an NBA analyst, that's for sure. Ooh, I don't know if Jeff would reject that comparison just out of lingering, lingering like somewhere <laughs> deep in his soul. You know that he doesn't want to be um, compared. Uh, uh, you mentioned the um, the Starks dunk, and I wanted to go back to the Starks dunk, which is Game Two of the '93 Conference Finals, and puts the and really, I it's in the last minute of the game. Like it's just, it's not just a highlight; it's a massively important shot. That kind of like thirty eight seconds to go, something like that. I puts think. the Knicks up by five. It's ninety one eighty yes. eight, and he dunks. Here is my issue with the Starks dunk. Even if you Google it, if you put in Starks dunk, Google will auto fill for you on Jordan Starks dunk on Jordan. That is not a dunk on Jordan. That dunk is on Horace Grant, 
And Michael comes in at the last second to swipe at it from like the foul. That is, he did not dunk on Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan is tangentially involved in a Starks dunk on Horace Grant. He was in the vicinity. And for Nick fans, that's all that matters. <laughs> he was in the vicinity. You can't take that away from us. You, you just can't do that. I just did. And he, um, so, so, but I, I never got to go to a, a Knicks playoff game at the Garden at that time. But I remember watching those games on TV and just thinking the noise and the atmosphere is overwhelming to me, and I'm watching on television. I can't imagine. It's not that road teams couldn't win there because Indiana had big wins there. Chicago had big wins there. But I just remember thinking it just seems like this NBA arena is louder than any other place. I mean, do you re- What do you remember of the atmosphere of just those crowds from like 92 to 95? It's interesting you, you, you phrase it that way because I've always felt that there are only a handful of places in all of sports where you feel the crowd when you're watching it on television. Uh, it doesn't happen a lot. You can hear, oh, crowd is loud, but you almost feel the crowd when you're watching it on television. And now, again, as a Nick fan, as a, a lifetime New Yorker, I've lived my whole life in New York. Maybe I'm not the most objective, but I, I do think in a big game, there's no better building in the world than Madison Square Garden. Now, I said earlier, Chicago Stadium is the loudest. Yes, that's the loudest building I've ever been in. Really? But in, ter- but in terms of electricity, uh, just the feel of the place, the way the crowd is situated, um, it's the best sports experience ever when it's a big game. And that particular, you know, during that playoff run, uh, it just it was off the charts the way it felt. Every single night you walked in, you, you'd get this electricity – in warmups. And then when the game started, it just, uh, it's an incredible experience to, to sit there for, for, uh, for a Nick playoff game. And, you know, you can even tell it's like now during the rough times, Knicks will be playing in a game and their, you know, the record is 18 and 55 and it's a tie game with three minutes remaining against uh, the Charlotte Hornets who are a team that's 25 games under 500. And the place is still has a special feeling like that. And, you know, I, I can't wait. Hopefully it's going to be sooner rather than later for big playoff games because it is. It's the best atmosphere in all of pro sports, in my um, New York opinion. So so last old Knicks question, the 95 series between the Knicks and the Pacers um, is, is an I don't, it's a second round series. I don't know if it's underrated because NBA diehards all remember it, but like it's bookended in game one by Reggie Miller, eight points in nine seconds. And game seven, Ewing missing the potential game-tying finger roll to send game seven into overtime, both in New York. I mean, like, that is as crazy a ser- of a bookend series as has ever happened in, in basketball. But, like, those two games are – those are crazy, iconic moments. It, it was the underrated rivalry in that stretch for them. Obviously, the Bulls were special, but that was one-sided. Uh, for the most part, the Miami Heat rivalry is usually considered the best because all of those series went to the the final deciding game, whether it was best of five or best of seven. But this one, you know, these teams were almost mirror images of each other. And there was real healthy competitive disdain uh, between the two. I don't think it was much hate as the Miami series. There was a little more respect, um, but it was, it was so much, uh, so much fun to watch because the Knicks Pacers series, it seemed every possession mattered. You know, a possession two minutes into the game, oh, that's a that's a big play. That you felt, oh, that's a big call. Whether it was a foul call on a key player, whether it was a three point play of a certain player that you knew needed to get going early, it just seemed like every possession mattered so much. And the other dynamic too, and it's funny. I tell him this all the time. I hated Mark Jackson during that stretch. Hated him. He was he was such an instigator. He got Reggie Miller going. He got John Starks going. He got guys going on his own team. He got guys going on on opponent's team. He was, I mean, he played the villain, a Nick villain, as well as anybody has played during that stretch. Um, And that's one of the, that's one of the memories I have for that. But it was also, it was heartbreaking because, you know, once he, once he missed that finger roll, uh, again, the air just went out of the building. Right. And then, um, and then obviously with, with the whole Riley news after that, it was, it was like the end of a very special era that, that didn't last very long. And that that's the hard thing about it. It should have lasted longer. And people, people knew obviously that Riley was 
a, a flight risk during that game, after that game, during that series. It was like there, the it was in the air that Riley could be gone. Um, the Reggie game, I mean, I, Reggie hits a three on an out of bounds play, steals the ball, fouls Greg Anthony, probably fouls Greg Anthony to steal, knocks him over and steals the ball, hits another. Three. Wait, no, wait, 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 wait. Let's let's go back. You you use the word probably. Now you're talking about Jordan, not part of the block, and now you say probably. Okay, fouls foul. Greg Anthony, he fouls Greg fouled. Anthony, and then does the I'm innocent hand gesture in the middle of right, the game. That shows you right there. Um, and then steals the amount of pass, hits another three, and from there, it's a straight comedy of errors. The whole rest of the game is a straight comedy of errors. The Pacers foul Starks stupidly with like 14 seconds left in the game. Starks misses both free throws in a tie game. Ewing rebounds the second one, and instead of holding for the last shot, and I can't really blame him for this because it's instinctual and it's a decent look, puts up a little eight-foot mini jumper, which misses, and then they foul Reggie Miller on the rebound, who's like a 90% free throw shooter. He hits both of them. Knicks call timeout, and their last play, Greg Anthony falls over and the clock runs out. That is like those last 13 seconds after Reggie's second three are like every – it's like Keystone Cops. You know, it's the the game six, the Heat Spurs, which we talked about earlier, you know, about five or six things had to happen for the Heat to win that game in the final 30 seconds – uh, when that was going on after the game, one of the things I thought about was like it, it was reminiscent of that Reggie Miller game because, as you said, it, there had to be about four or five things to happen that never happened, that never would have happened, but all happened, and, and that's what caused it. It was, it was <laughs> unbelievable. Now, I remember I was doing the game on radio, and I remember saying on the air, uh, people were leaving the garden. Some of the people were, were walking out before the game ended. And I remember saying to Clyde on the thinking, air, thinking saying, the Knicks had won. Where are, where are the, right. Where are these people going? Don't they know Reggie Miller is in the building? And then, you know, never thinking it was going to happen. And then he comes and he does something like that. That cemented his place as, as perhaps the all time Nick villain. What is your favorite Clyde Frazier saying or word or phrase? <laughs> uh, I, I think my favorite is still, uh, when he calls a rookie a precocious neophyte. Neophyte just, is my favorite, too. Neophyte's my favorite. I love neophyte. Right. It's perfect, but precocious neophyte. And, you know, what people, some don't know where this, uh, all the, the big words started. When he was first starting doing radio, a lot, he'd go speak to, to kids at schools, and the kids would ask him about some of the words that he used. And he would tell them the definition. Then he said to himself, you know what? A lot of these kids are listening to the game on the radio. This is back before, you know, everybody had cable TV and they couldn't watch it. So he thought, okay, some of these kids are asking them about certain words. I'm going to start expanding my vocabulary on the air to teach them words and help them. That, so it's a very noble reason why he started it. And then it just became something he loved doing and it became part of of who he was as an announcer, but that was the origin for it. It was to help young kids who young Nick fans uh, perhaps increase their vocabulary. I like when a rookie, like to your point about precocious neophyte, when a rookie does something that surprises him and the neophyte sounds a little bit different, like, Oh, the neophyte, oh, look at the, ne- <laughs> the neophyte. Uh, have you ever been in uh, Walt Frazier's closet and or closets and or an entire <laughs> whatever, wherever his clothes are stored? Have you ever seen them all lined up together? No, unfortunately, I have not had the honor. I've seen, we've done a couple of specials on it over the years, and it, it is a sight to see on TV. I would imagine it's, it's, it's even better in person. Um, what I love is when he talks about what he does, he goes um, to uh, rug stores and designs on rugs are what he looks at and says, you know what, that design would be perfect. And he uses those for patterns on his suits because nobody is making suits like that. But no. that's, how he, that's how he gets his idea. And one of, one of my favorite things, you know, every year the, when they're new Nick players, when they're on the layup line, they're always like pointing and looking over. But every night that he's got one of those suits on, the opposing team is distracted on their layup line to see what he's wearing. It's it's truly incredible. It's not carrying over into games and getting the Knicks any Ws, but I'm glad to know it helps in the, in the, in the layup line. What, <laughs> what what is your favorite? What is your single favorite memory of Lynn Sanity? 
Um, I think the Toronto game. Now, I've I've been blessed to be able to call a lot of um, big games, historic games, games that mattered so much more. But those couple of weeks of insanity was the most fun I've ever had as, as a broadcaster. Um, you could not wait to get to the arena every single night because you wanted to see, could this kid do it again? You know, after that first game against the Nets, it was like, wow, that was so much fun. And then you're like, okay, we'll see. And then he does it again against Utah a couple of nights later. And then it was like, wow, can, can, can he do it again? Can he do it again? It was just, you know, you'd be, it'd be 10 o'clock in the morning. You'd be either in your hotel or home, depending if it was on a road or home game. And you're like, I want to go to the gym now. I want to go to the arena now. Uh, but the, the Toronto game, because uh, I don't think I've ever heard a visiting player get such an ovation when he was announced to the starting lineup as Jeremy Lin did that night in Toronto. The roar when he was announced as a starter for the opponent was the loudest I've ever heard. Kobe's had a few of those when I've seen him on the road, you know, at, at the end of a season where he's playing against a team that may have been out of it. There were Laker fans everywhere. But Jeremy Lin was the loudest. And then when the opposing player hits what turns to be the game-winning shot, the loud, the cheer, and there weren't a lot of Nick fans there. It was mostly Raptor fans. The cheer for, for an opposing player hitting a winning shot against their team was also the loudest I've ever heard. Is there a call in your long and illustrious career that you listened to again and said, boy, I'd like to have a second crack at that? <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I think a lot of play-by-play guys will tell you the same thing. There's a lot of them you would do differently or you wish was a little different. Um, I probably have two, one from a long time ago and one more recently. Can I, can I tell you yeah, both? Go, of them? go, absolutely. Uh, 2000 Olympics uh, in Australia. The United States is playing Lithuania, and Lithuania was really good. And it's a close game. And Lithuania is down by two. And I remember uh, Sarunas Javakevicis, who played yeah. a little bit with the Pacers. Yeah. He was a great international player. In the final seconds, he takes a three-pointer. It's kind of like the Starks thing. He takes a three-pointer that if it goes in, they beat the USA, and they're out. No gold medal. And it would have been the first time that they lost an Olympic competition, you know, since the NBA players start. And as the shot goes up, it one of those rattles in like a look it's going to go in. And then it comes out. And my call was, I, I thought it was going in. So I'm about to say, oh, it's good. Lithuania wins. But when it rattles out, I said, oh, no. <laughs> and it came out like I was disappointed. I uh. said, oh, no. And it bothered me. And it was just a reaction from it almost when it came out. And it really bothered me. Now, the game was on. It was being taped. It wasn't on live. And I remember going to the NBC bosses. Uh, Dick Ebersole and Tommy Roy, and I told them, listen, we might have a problem. I, I really, I think I blew the call at the end because it, it did sound like I was disappointed. And we looked at the tape and they said, well, you know, if we want, we can, you know, if if you want, maybe we can do something about it. And I'm like, no, 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 I, I can't. That's my call. That's my, that's the way I called it. I don't want it changed. I want it on. I want it on that way. And so it went on that way. And it was, you know, it worked out fine. And then, you know, I pumped up at United States one, but the initial call to this day still bothers me that it came out like, Oh no. The one I always think about, and you'll get to your second one in a second, that would scare me if I were in a play by play announcer is the shot that is short, but grazes the net and kind of looks like a swish from the, like if you see it from the wrong angle, it looks like, and you can see fans get fooled by it. Cause there's like a segment of fans that cheer that one. Whenever I see a shot like that, I'm like, boy, I feel bad for the broadcasters. Cause I can see them falsely reacting to a make. If you're above, if you're um, like the radio boots now is, is high above that can happen easily. If you're on court level, it usually, you usually it's, it's, it, that'd be very difficult to have happen from that level to see it. All right. So um, what's the second one? The second one was in uh, 2016 in Game 7. Okay. Um, Kyrie Irving hits that enormous three. And I wish I wish I would have used my bang call on that. I try and, and not use, overuse that 
because I, I think it's, you know, save it for real special calls or just don't overuse it because then it gets tired. Uh, and I, in most cases, I don't use bang for a team, a road team who hits a big shot. It's mostly a home team because the reason for the call is when the crowd is exploding, you want to have a quick one syllable bang and let the crowd rise. You don't want to be yelling over a crowd and have a long call. Um, but still on a big car, I've kind of changed that a little bit. I'll do it on a road. But my thinking in this is that, okay, Ivan Irving hits a big shot, and I, I had a lot of energy and passion into the call, but I didn't say bang because there was still like 30-some-odd seconds left in the game, and the odds of either Steph Curry or Clay Thompson hitting a big three-pointer, I was saving it for that. And obviously they didn't hit one. So there's part of me that wishes I would have I've used that. I, I think that would have been a, a good call. I think the call was 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 fine and good. Yeah, it was a good I call. I've, was, I've watched that shot again. It's a good enthusiastic call. Right, but I think it would have it could have had a little something extra if I used that. So I that's one of my kind of think back of that uh, that maybe I could have used bang on that. Well, your most famous bang is obviously the double bang when Steph hits the 35 footer in Oklahoma City, which is one of those moments where every NBA fan knows exactly where they were when that shot happened because it was so crazy. And my favorite thing about that is it's not the double bang. It's the second bang. The octave in your voice <laughs> goes up like it goes up like half an octave. And I always love when that happens to announcers because that's when you really know the moment has infected like every inch of their body and soul and they can't quite control how their voice sounds. And that's the best. That was, that, uh, you're right. That one lost control on that one. And that <laughs> but was, that's, a, that's a, good though. No, it, absolutely. Um, it, listen, I, I, I love, I've loved the game of basketball since I was a little kid. I am so crazy about NBA basketball. So I have that joy when I see something like that, but that was, that was accumulation call. Because it was, they were on this just magical run that we had never seen, and this this spectacular player was doing things night in and night out. And this particular game, they were losing. He got hurt. He left the game for a while, and for him to come back and for them to win that game, for him to do that, it was like this. This is like a storybook. You can't believe that. So it was so much led up to that. It wasn't just that particular shot. It was the way they had been playing, the way he'd been playing, and the way that game had gone on where it just just lost it. So I, I believe you don't have a, a Twitter account or a social media presence, which is very smart and speaks well of you. But you, I do have a Twitter oh, account. Oh, you do? Okay. Right. Um, but it's I've, I've only tweeted once. Oh, so and my name's count. not on it. Um, but I use it. That's how I follow the league. That's how I follow everybody, uh, all NBA writers and and players and stuff to to keep up on the league. It's a it's a great way to do it. I just don't tweet. Now you became a social media. I'm going to say phenomenon. You know, for a, a, a day during this COVID nineteen stuff, where you hit. I, I'm just guessing it's one take where you hit a, a shot, a jumper in your backyard hoop, and you're telling everybody to stay in and uh, just you know hit a little jump shot. Um, so that leads me to transition into this. Um, please tell your version of the story of the 15 year free throw shooting competition <laughs> with Scott Brooks that I have now heard about from two separate sources, including Scott Brooks and the way they tell it, it just can't possibly have unfolded like this. It's sound, it's too good to be true. So please tell the story. All right. So Scott Brooks is a, is a, um, a backup point guard, third string point guard on the 97 Knicks. And, and that's one of my early years, and we're about the same age. So we became we became good friends back then. So it was it was a really nice relationship. And one day we're in Phoenix, and uh, he was he was shooting free throws. And uh, I, I always kid him. I said I said the only reason you're on this team is because you can shoot free throws, and I can shoot free throws better than you. You know, just making fun of him because he didn't play a lot that year. Although he was. He had a 10-year career as a scrappy, tough player. He, he was a good player. Um, anyway, but I would, would uh, be breaking his horns about it. So he goes, oh, yeah, you think you're a better free throw shooter? Let's go. So we go to shoot free throws, and we're going to have a contest, and we're going to shoot 50 free throws. I'll shoot five, he'll shoot five. I'll shoot five, he'll shoot five. That's the way we're going to do it. So I hit my first five, he hits his first five. I hit my next five, he hits his next five. I actually hit my first 35 free throws. He hit his first 35 free throws. 
so Jeff far the Van- stories are matching up. So far the stories okay. are matching. So Jeff Van Gundy is is the coach, and it practice is over. Let's go to the bus. And you didn't waste another moment. So he had to go. So contest is over. I declare victory because I tied an NBA player. He's like, no, no, no. We'll we got we'll finish this another time. But we never got back to it that season. For some reason, it just just never happened. Now we go to, I'm going to say 2011. I'm doing an Oklahoma City game. Might even been the first game of the season, uh, or at least one of the first couple of games of the season. And we go out. He's the coach of the Thunder. We go out to uh, uh, to practice, and practice is over. And I'm out there shooting free throws um, afterwards, just waiting for him to finish with the media. And he comes out and he says. Uh, Hey, let's finish our, cause we had talked about it over the years. Let's finish our, our contest. I'm like, okay, that's good. That's good. Now I'd been shooting around for about 10, 15 minutes. So I was warmed up. He hadn't taken a shot in probably days. So we do it again with 50 free throws. Same thing. I do five. He does five. Well, I hit my first 45. He hits his first 45. So we're even again. Stories are matched up. I don't know if you guys have agreed to, 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 to but it's, it's, so you guys are like, 90 for 90 or something like this point. Correct. So I get up to, to 48. I hit 48 in a row. I missed the 49th. And then I hit number 50. So I'm 49 out of 50. So he goes and he goes 46, 47, 48, 49. And now he looks over, takes the ball with his left hand. He's a righty. Winks and banks it in with his left hand for the 50th in a row and just walks away. He was, banks it, was it just, in? Banks it in. It, he he didn't tell such, me he banked it. Oh, yeah. it was. He was so cocky about it and so arrogant. I was <laughs> I was so mad. If he just hit them all in a row, it would have been fine. But he had to be a show-off and use his left hand with a banker. So in his version of the story, you went over these 15 years in two sessions. You went 99 out of 100. And he went a hundred for a hundred. I don't know if the raw math is a hundred attempts, but that's that's what, and like I don't care if you're an NBA player or you're you were a good high school player and you obviously shoot around ninety nine out of a hundred or eighty nine out of ninety or whatever it is. Like that's pretty freaking spectacular. I, I would I'll never be able to do it again. But for some, I think I was motivated by just my desire to beat him, and it was eighty five free throws because we only shot thirty five the first okay. year. Okay, so okay. it was it was eighty four at eighty five. And you, you uh, never know and, as you never know as guys get older, these stories become Paul Bunyan esque. So Scotty <laughs> has already started adding free throw attempts to the, to the total. <laughs> but that um, was my shining moment as a as a free throw shooter. Can I ask you a couple more quick fun questions before I let you go? Oh, of course. Um, you're a Mets fan, correct? Lifelong, crazy Mets fan. What's what's pick, pick pick either side of the spectrum, and I know that Mets fans tend to. I know which side of the spectrum most Mets fans go to. I'm also a, a Mets fan growing up. Uh, what's your best or lowest moment as a Mets fan? Either one. Um, the best one was was obviously Game Six in '86 um, because you know, we were done. It was, it was over. And soon as, you know, and the calls are great. Finn Scully's call is great as the ball's dribbling towards Bill it Buckner. gets through Buckner. Right. And the ironic thing was I, I'm a Met, I was always a Bill Buckner fan. For some reason, I, I loved him as a player. So I, I did feel bad for him, but it was such a special thing. And I was, I was working as a producer at NBC radio and I was covering that game and the press box was so packed. They were putting people everywhere. And I was, in the back of the Red Sox radio booth. That's the only room they had. And I lost my objectivity as a member of the media and I'm going crazy. And uh, they kind of turned around. They were not, they were not pleased with my conduct, but that was, that was probably, (laughs) that was probably the best moment. Um, The worst moment I think was probably uh, when Carlos Beltran took that, that third strike against the Cardinals. Uh, That was because that's the one, you know, uh, we were a great team that year, and I thought that was a year where we were going to win it all. And we were right there. And that was prior in that game. Andy Chavez made that spectacular catch, one of the great catches in Met history. Um, so probably those. Although 69, all the members from 69 is are special, but that's when I was a little older and, and would go to more games. Uh, so I think those two probably are. are the lowest moment for me is, I won't belabor it because I mentioned it before, is, in, is indisputably game one of the 2000 World Series because that's a loss at Yankee Stadium. First of all, it's the Yankees. And 
I, I my hate for the I mean hate is a word I don't use lightly and <laughs> in, 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 in any other real context, but I, I hate the Yankees hate. And I, I would have given, I'm actually afraid to think about what I would have given for the Mets to win that world series. <laughs> I, 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 it actually scares me a little bit, but when they lost game one, it is actually, it was one of those gut punch losses where I, I just knew deep in my soul, the world series is over, even though it was only one game. I knew it. It's amazing how certain series, the, the whole tone of a series can happen game one can decide everything obviously there's still games to be played but uh you're right that was one of those it set the tone for the whole thing i'm like you that that uh as a met fan i i, I root, used to root for the yankees because my 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 great friend michael k i wanted to see him uh called you know world series championships um but after he won a couple of rings with that i'm like okay that's enough but some of my favorite players i loved roy white as a kid i loved thurman munson and I love Don Mattingly. And how do you not love Mariano Rivera, even if you're a Yankee uh, hater? I can't. I can't. Just the saying his name, just shivers just went down my body <laughs> because that was the big – I don't – look, I'm not a baseball analyst or anything like that, but I just remember thinking we can argue about who the best player is on all these Yankee teams that were so dominant for six, seven, eight, nine years. Mariano Rivera to me was the MVP of those teams. Because when you face the Yankees in the playoffs, and you like, I just rooted for everyone they played. I've, so we is like every Yankee opponent in the playoffs is we to me. If you were losing in the fifth inning, like panic was already beginning to set in because in a big playoff game, they can throw them out there for two and a third or something. You just like you, you're just I, I I'm I, I'm sure teams felt that same panic. He was he was with the exception of a couple of moments, you know, the Luis Gonzalez blooper, the Red Sox comeback in '04. Uh, the Indian series in '95 before they before they become dominant. I mean, he was like you just couldn't do anything. It was over. It was Jordan like you thought he's on. Okay, this game is over. Same same feeling you had. Last question, and it's a question I've asked a lot of guests in this depressing, um, scary time. And I know you're prepared with an answer, so I'm going to ask you: What is the hardest you have ever laughed in a movie? Uh, just watched the movie the other day because uh, my kids are, are my two of my younger ones are back home with us now during this isolation time, and it's the Bird Cage. Oh, interesting! Have you ever seen the Bird Cage? Uh, the Nathan there there are there two Bird Cages right there? D- no, I, no, there's just the one. So just Ronald Nathan Williams, Lane, Robin Gene, Williams, yeah, and and Gene Hackman and Hank Azaria, um, who is one of the most talented people in the entertainment field. The four of them, the performances they put on, it's just like one belly laugh after another. I, I, we, and we just watched it the other night. That's, that's my favorite comedy. And I, 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 I have a, so many hearty laughs during that course of course. I got to watch that again because I don't, I don't remember it very well. Um, so what, now you're what's yours. Me, uh, I have said this on a couple of occasions. Number one, um, the South Park movie. Um, where they, I don't, you probably have never seen the South Park movie, I'm guessing. I have not. Uh, but there's an opening song in the South Park movie that I, I literally fell off a couch. That's so good. And then, uh, Dumb well, do, you, Dumb- do you, do you still, here's the thing. Do you still laugh as hard if you go back and watch it? Uh, different kind of laugh because you can't duplicate the shock value of the first time. Right. But right. it's, it's just as deep of an admiration laugh for it's just all out cleverness and bravery to make a song like this. Okay. Um, so that, that's the one that I give. All right, Mike Breen, you've given us way too much time. Um, just one of the best guys and the hall of famer. I mean, that's, that's, that about sums it up. We all miss hearing your voice. Um, I will be uh, contacting you later for some shoots and ladders negotiations with your agent. <laughs> um, but just, uh, fans have been listening to you for so long. You're the best. Um, thank you for coming on. Oh, Zach, my, it was an honor. Thank you. Thank you so much.